first of all, some things that are generic about doctoral education uh, is preparation for a career as a researcher where you create new knowledge and as a teacher where you spread new knowledge. And it works almost everywhere by apprenticeship. You have some courses, but the core of what doctoral education is, is doing projects under supervision of somebody else who's done it before. Doctoral study in information, or actually any study in information at, uh, here, starts with we have sort of a central perspective on the world. That when we look at any situation, we see the information first. So we say, if you want to understand why things are the way they are, or if you want to change how they are, you should follow the information. Who knows what and when and how does that information affect their actions? And then how could you change those actions if you change the availability of information? So different disciplines, different professional schools have different perspectives uh, on the world. And of course, the world is one place, so we are looking at, at the same thing. But where we'll notice the information first, economics and business might say, if you want to understand the world, follow the money. That's determinative of, of actions of individuals and institutions. Political science and law might ask, who has the power? We say, who has the information? And that's our starting point. That's not the ending point. If you want to understand the world and you start with information, you still got to look at money, you still got to look at power. But our starting point is information. These are the kind of books that are in our orbit but that have sort of, most, most of them have made it into being semi-popular. So maybe you've seen some of these like Clay Shirky's Cognitive Surplus or Danny Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow or uh, The Design of Everyday Things by Donald Norman or Larry Lessig's Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace. He's running for president now, by the way. I don't know if any of you noticed that. He didn't have the 1% that he needed to get into the, uh, into the Democratic debate. Uh, so these are, these are kind of uh, books that are in our orbit. Maybe they're things that, that some of them that, that you might have seen. Many of us who work here, we're producing new knowledge. Most of us are not writing books most of the time, but a few of us have. So one of the most recent ones is, is Kentaro Tayama's Geek Heresy it came out earlier this year. You might have seen it. The central argument is that um, technology acts as an amplifier of human and institutional capacities rather than something that will change the world on its own. Uh, and so he was one of the, the founders of Microsoft Research in India that has done a lot of ICT for development projects. And um, that's sort of his conclusion after having spent 10 years on these computer technologies for development projects. You can see my book in the upper right and uh, online communities. Uh, Paul Edwards has a book called the, the vast, A Vast Machine on understanding um, how do we know what we know about global climate change. So things like uh, all of everything we've got is based on sensor readings. And we'd like to know, is, it war is the Earth warmer today than it was 70 years ago? We don't have the same sensor today that we had 70 years ago. And they're not in the same places. And if, even if we did, you know, it would be rusted <laughs> and corroded. And it wouldn't be giving the same readings that it gave 70 years ago. So you know, how, how do we actually know things? And what is the social construction of, of, of how we know things? So those are the kinds of things that are in the orbit of the School of Information. So doctoral education at, at at School of Information here, how do we structure it? Well, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on collaboration. I know there's some doctoral programs where it's more of a solitary affair. Uh, you'll have, in all of them, you have some courses. But when you, the time you get to doing your own project, here your own project is usually not just you by yourself. Uh, is it a, a, uh, a focus on impact? That's impact on other scholars, but also impact often beyond the academy. The, both the faculty and students are hoping to 
change something in the Amazon or change something outside of the academy. Uh, we are very interdisciplinary. We have faculty who have their PhDs in computer science, in economics, in psychology, history, uh, what else? Communication. I miss communication. Uh, probably a few others. Uh, you'll get um, depth in something, but also breadth across, uh, across methods and concepts. So in, in your initial year, and I'll be talking a little bit more about, about this, this, the structure of what things are the required courses, there is breadth that you have to, you will find other students who are coming from very different background, and you're all going to get some common core of knowledge and, uh, about concepts and some common core of knowledge about methods, both of which are trying to give you a little bit of knowledge about a lot of things. But then, not with everybody else in the program, but finding what is the discipline that's for you, you're going to go in depth. So sometimes we sort of talk about this as the T. There's breadth and, and depth. And uh, one of the things that you get being at the School of Information is you get the rest of the University of Michigan. The University of Michigan is very strong in a lot of areas uh, across the social sciences, health, natural sciences, uh, and humanities. So uh, you're required to have one member of your dissertation committee who's not from the School of Information. That's sort of a university-wide requirement. Uh, and there's just there's sort of an expectation that there's some of your course requirements have to be outside of the School of Information. You're supposed to take advantage of the, of the University of Michigan context. All right, a little bit about the structure of the program. So there are, in any doctoral program, there are some things you have to do between matriculation, entering at the beginning, and leaving with your dissertation. Uh, in our case, uh, and generally you have to be making progress on those milestones along the way, and if you're not, then at some point you say, hey, maybe you shouldn't, shouldn't still be here. So these are the ones that we have in our program. The, the first, uh, and there are some required courses that I'll get to, but these are the, the things that are non-course uh, related. So one is a pre-candidacy proposal. You have to propose some piece of independent research, or maybe you call it semi-independent research, where you, there can be quite a bit of suggestion and feedback and guidance from an advisor, but it's your project. So you have to propose that in the first year. You have to finish it in the second year. So that's the pre-candidacy paper. At the end of your second academic year, you take what we call the field prelim. The uh, field prelim is where you prove to yourself and three faculty members that you have mastered some subfield. And part of the uh, part of the process is defining what subfield is yours that you're going to be the master of. Uh, so that that usually involves something where maybe you've already taken a course in an area, but you're getting up to the point where uh, you know that material so well that you could teach a graduate course in that area. Uh, so it's, it's usually a sort of a four to six week process of, of preparing them for that field prelim. You have to write something up, and then you have to make a presentation to the, to the faculty. Uh, when you've done that, and you've done your required courses, then you are a candidate for the doctorate. Ideally, if things are all going smoothly, that happens at the end of your second year. And then all that's left between you and, and finishing is the dissertation, which you might think is, well, I've done all those things. I have only one thing left that you're, you know, you're just six months away. But no, usually you're, you're two to four years away at that point. What you then have is a license to go out and, and, and do uh, a dissertation project. So you'll have a, a proposal along the way. And then you have to write the dissertation and defend it in a, in a public oral defense. You, in, our, in our program, you're also, uh, we're training you to be a researcher, a scholar, and a, uh, and a teacher. And there, is some, uh, there are some requirements related to developing you as a teacher. You have to serve as a graduate student instructor for at least two terms. 
And we provide various uh, supports, workshops that you have to go to as part of that, and someone who sits in on one of your classes and gives you feedback on how you're doing in teaching and, and things like that. When you're a doctoral student here, uh, and, I, and I hope, because you've all had a lot of schooling already. Many of you, it sounds like you're already in master's degree programs. Uh, there are a lot of things that are, that are different between master's and doctoral. One of them is funding. Usually in master's programs, you pay your own way. And in doctoral programs, you don't. In our doctoral program, uh, all of our students get uh, funding, which means tuition, stipend, and, and some fringe benefits. Now, the tuition means you don't, you don't pay the, the school. Uh, stipend is, what are we at, 2,000 something a month now? Mm -hmm. So for those of you who've been working in industry for 10 years, sorry. <laughs> that ain't too good. But, uh, but for those of you who have been students and have been calling on your savings, uh, it, it's enough to live on. It's not enough to live on uh, luxuriously. Uh, and then the benefits are health insurance for you, and if, you're, if you have a spouse and children, they're also covered. That, that uh, funding is during the academic year. Uh, and summers, it's possible that you can get funding but through the school, but it's not guaranteed. We t generally don't have many teaching assistantships available in the summertime, uh, but many students work on uh, projects that their advisors have grant funding for, and then they would, we get the stipend in the summer. The benefits do continue in the summer, by the way, even if you're not on the, uh, even if you're not getting the stipend during the summer. We also guarantee at least one summer where you'll get get that spring summer and stick around. Typically, that's the first year, uh, but some students do get outside internships in their first year, and they're off, and then they can save that that one spring summer for another later year. Admissions, I hope this is still right. Deadline is December 1 still? Yeah, okay. December 1 uh, is the deadline for applying. Uh, you apply centrally uh, through, the, through, the, through the website. Uh, but our review and decision-making process about it is quite decentralized, involving basically any of the faculty who might be your supervisor. Uh, so in your application, you should certainly figure out a few but not too many faculty who you would like to potentially be your advisor. And to do that involves a fair bit of work. You've got to go look and read some of their papers and say, that's the kind of paper I'd like to be able to write. Uh, and uh, mentioning those specific faculty, whoever you mention are the first people that that the application is going to get circulated to. They might say, oh, actually, so-and-so is even better, and the student maybe didn't realize it, and, and I'll, I'll pass the application on. But the people you mentioned will be the, the first to get it. I, I say mention a few, but not too many, because if you mention 19 faculty, we're going to think that um, you haven't really done your homework, because there's no way that 19 different people are going to be a good fit for, for one. But, but you should mention more than one, and this is advice I give to everybody. You shouldn't go to a doctoral program where there's only one person there who you could imagine working with uh, and having a good experience as, as, your, as your supervisor because they might leave. Academia, people move on, they get sick, and you know, but also they just take jobs at other places. So make sure that there's at least two people, and you know, obviously, One's going to be a better fit for you than the second, but, but make sure that number two is not too bad. All right. Why? Are you the kind of person who should get a PhD? This is my list of characteristics that you can ask. Am I like that? You're school smart. Right? We've all heard the distinction between being street smart and school smart and whatever, different emotional intelligence and musical intelligence and all that. This is a place where it really helps to be school smart. Read books, you answer questions, you think well on your feet. That's, this is the kind of place for that. You've been in school before, 
professors have given you required readings and said, you know, if you're interested, you should, you should check these things out. If you're the kind of person who actually sometimes read the optional readings, this might be the kind of place for you because you'd be doing a lot of reading here. Uh, when you're reading, you've read a paper and it cites something else, at least sometimes you've said, hmm, I wonder, I wonder about that. Let me, go, let me go read the thing that they were citing. If that ever happened to you, then you might be the kind of person who's a good candidate for doctoral education. If you get animated by new ideas, you, you read something or you heard it on the radio uh, and you're getting together with your friends or your family at dinner time, and you say, guess what I heard today? You know, sometimes I talk about sports, you know, sometimes I, but at least sometimes are you, are you saying, wow, I just, I just heard this idea that maybe we could, you know, we, ha we had a talk earlier this week from a, a visiting guest lecture, and I'm still spinning around in my, in my head of, of uh, that we can use machine learning algorithms to, to predict uh, which of the people who've been arrested are more likely to commit a crime or less likely to commit a crime between the time of their arrest and, and their trial, so that judges are deciding all the time who to let out on bail and who not to, and there's all kinds of public policy issues around it, and, and they've, they've, you know, they, they did this thing and figured out actually they can predict better than the judges can, and that we could have the same crime rate of, of people who've been released and release a lot more people, or we could release the same people and have less crime, and by the way, less racial bias too. Uh, so that was like, I've been talking to everybody about that for the last five days. If you hear, so, you know, you hear come across an idea and it animates you and you want to talk to everybody about it, that's the kind of person who should get a PhD. When you were in school uh, and you had a problem set, were you the one who other people were going to to help them finish the problem set? That's partly an indicator that you're school smart, but it's also partly an indicator that you kind of like teaching. So that would be another indicator that maybe you should get a PhD. Oh, yeah. And that when they came to you, that was sort of the most fun part of your day. That might be an indicator that you have a future in teaching. Uh, that you often try to articulate why things work and not just whether they work. This is one that I like. Um, you, uh, you had a problem set and you got the answer. Did you go on to... Do you always just go on to the next problem? Or do you stick with it and you say, hmm, I wonder if there's a second way to solve it. I wonder what else I could do with the same technique I used to solve that. So if you tend to sort of stay with the problem, everybody else is bored, they're sick and tired of hearing you talking about it and you're still talking about the same thing, that's perseverance and, and sort of intellectual curiosity. Those are things that might make you be a good PhD student. So some ideas of maybe behavioral or, or uh, personal characteristics that should indicate to you that you might be a good match for this. I want to just give you a, a little sense of the breadth and substance of what our students are interested in. And I'm going to do that by telling you a little bit about a few of our current first year students and then also what some of the recent dissertation topics have been of people who finished and, 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 where, they're, and where they're working now. So in our first year cohort, uh, Gene Hardy, he got his uh, well, undergraduate in English from the University of Washington and then was a graduate student, he did the MSI program at Michigan. Chi Ching He was an undergraduate at Union College it's a liberal arts college in, in New York State. And she was a dual major in computer science and art. And then uh, in between undergraduate and graduate school, she got some the Watson, Fellowship. the Watson Fellowship that basically allowed her to travel all around the world. Uh, and she chose to do it uh, looking at um, weaving and, and, and yarn making. And uh, so that's what she's done. But then now she's... Uh, now she's here as a doctoral student. Chai-Yin Shao uh, studied computer science in Taiwan at NTU. Tsuyoshi Kano studied electrical and computer engineering at uh, Yokohama National University in Japan. And then 
MIS, Management Information Systems, also there. And then he's been working, was he at the World Bank? In India. The world, he was working at the World Bank in India for some years. Lin Feng Li studied math and economics at the University of Michigan and has stayed here for the doctoral program. Cindy Lin studied Asian studies at National University of Singapore. Samantha Lusher studied English at UCLA. Meghana Maratha studied computer engineering at University of Mumbai in India, and then computer science as a graduate student at Toronto. Ed Platt studied computer science and physics at MIT, and then did, a, did graduate work in applied mathematics at University of Waterloo. And Sriti Raj, this is our whole first year class, isn't it? Sriti Raj uh, studied computer science at Banaras Hindu University in India and uh, did a master's degree in computer and information systems at UC Irvine. Hari Subramanyam studied telecom in India and then was a graduate student in human computer interaction, HCI, at SI. I had the pleasure of working with him. Uh, Penny True studied psychology at Randolph College, another liberal arts college. Uh, Chen Wang, who didn't give us his photo, uh, studied electrical engineering at Zhejiang University in China, and then systems engineering for his master's degree at Cornell. Iman Yekazari studied computer engineering uh, at the University of Science and Culture in Tehran, and then uh, uh, has two master's degree, one, one, from, one from, uh, from Iran and one at UMSI in, hum in human computer interaction. So that gives you a little sense of the breadth internationally, disciplinarily. We've got the engineers, we've got the English majors, the artists, the artists and computer scientists and the same person, uh, Iran, India, Japan, uh, Singapore, China, and the United States. So recent graduates, so those, that, that gives you a sense of sort of where people have come from. What do they produce when they're here? What are their dissertations and where do they go to when they're done? So this one is not everybody. This one is, is a, is a uh, selective list, but Dharma Akman uh, studied, or her dissertation title was the role of con the role of conceptions of value in data practices, multi-case study of three small teams of ecological scientists. So there's a strain of, of work in the school that is studying the information practices of scientists in other scientific realms. So she studied ecological scientists. She's now a platform manager at ProQuest. Eitan Bakshi. His dissertation was titled Information Diffusion and Social Influence in Online Networks. He's a data scientist at Facebook. Matt Burton blogs his information infrastructure for scholarly communication. He's now a postdoc at the University of Pittsburgh. Devin Donaldson, development of a scale for measuring perceptions of trustworthiness for digitized archival documents. So when you see this development of a scale, a scale is basically a way of measuring something. And what he was a set of survey questions, and he had to do a lot of validation to see whether those set of questions are actually measuring what he's claiming that they were measuring. And he is now an assistant professor at Indiana University School of Informatics. Tao Dong. Designing Reflective User Experience with Social and Ubiquitous Computing Technologies. He's a UX researcher at Google. Jessica Hullman, Understanding and Supporting Trade-Offs in the Design of Visualizations for Communication. She's an assistant professor at the University of Washington. Tron Jacobson, The Identity of Evidence, Documentary Evidence in the Federal Acknowledgement Process. He's a director of forensics. That's debate at the University of Oregon. Gina Hu, supporting collaborative help for individualized problems, learning from the MythTV user community 
and diabetes patient support groups. She's a postdoctoral fellow at the School of Medicine at University of Washington. Adam Kreisberg, The Changing Landscape of Digital Access, Public-Private Partnerships in U.S. State and Territorial Archives. He's a postdoc at the University of Maryland in their high school. Tracy Liu, Experimental Studies of Culture, Diversity, and Crowdsourcing. She's now an assistant professor at Tsinghua University in China. That's one of their, they call it the MIT of China. It's one of their top universities, and she's in their economics department. Sean Munson was my doctoral student, so I'm very proud of him. His uh, t dissertation was Exposure to Political Diversity Online, and he is now a, an assistant professor at the University of Washington. Beth St. Jean, Information Behavior of People Diagnosed with a Chronic Serious Health Condition, a Longitudinal Study. She's an assistant professor at the University of Maryland in their high school. Brian Hillegas, Patient Handoffs Between Emergency Department and Inpatient Physicians, a Qualitative Study to Inform Standardization of Practice and Organization Theory. He's an assistant professor in public health at Ohio State University. So again, fair bit of breadth, some international. Uh, a lot of our students are ending up in other I schools. You saw Washington, Maryland, uh, Indiana. Indiana. Uh, but also, they end up in other interdisciplinary schools like public health. Uh, one of them's in a medical school. Uh, one of them is in a traditional economics department. That's less common for our students. We have a very interdisciplinary training. It's less common for someone to go from our program to then teach in economics or psychology or computer science. It's, it's more often that people start their careers in disciplinary areas and, and move into interdisciplinary things somewhat later on. But occasionally, someone does go into an economics department or a computer science department. If you get a doctorate here or, or somewhere else, you're preparing to be part of the worldwide scholarly community. And the life of a scholar generally, especially in university settings, but even, even elsewhere, involves research, teaching, and service. You'll, you'll hear that as sort of the, the three legs of what you're preparing to do or actually doing as a doctoral student. And then it stays with you for the rest of your life. When I had my, when I had to submit my application to, to get promoted from assistant professor to associate professor and get considered for tenure, that's sort of this thing that usually happens after six or seven years uh, as, a, as an assistant professor. And if you don't get it, you have to leave. Uh, we're evaluated on teaching, research, and service. And I had to write up statements about Here's who I am as a researcher. Here's who I am as a teacher. Here's what I've done for, for service. Same thing when I went from associate to full professor. And in fact, every year, we get evaluated by you know, how, how was our, what was our job performance the last year. And we write up something where we say, what did we do in research? What did we do in teaching? What did we do in service? So those are the, those are the three pillars. As a doctoral student, in research, you will conduct studies, write and present papers, assist in grant writing, and eventually write a dissertation. In teaching, you'll lead discussion sections, prepare exams and problem sets, do some grading, maybe a lot of grading, uh, do be, maybe be a guest lecturer for, for, for a class, and mentor undergraduates, possibly even mentor uh, the master's students working on projects with you. In service, you will help. So service is about helping other people to be better scholars and helping institutions that, are, that keep the scholarly community running to, to run well. So attending practice talks, helping your fellow classmates your, to, to, uh, to give good talks when they go to give them publicly. Uh, reviewing papers, initially supervised. But uh, you know, the whole research process works. People do projects, they write things up, they submit them, and there's a peer review process. Somebody else who's not affiliated with that project and doesn't have a conflict of interest because they're not from your institution and 
They're just somebody else who's part of the scholarly community reads the paper and says, this was good or this wasn't good and is, it needs to be fixed in this way and it's ready for publication, it's not ready for publication. Eventually, you'll be doing that reviewing and, and we actually, as part of the doctoral program, you know, move, move you into that role. I have, I'm supervising a second year doctoral student right now and she's about to do her first, her first review and you know, I'm going to look over the review before, before it goes back in. You may also serve on committees. So we have a doctoral executive committee, which is basically the set of students who help uh, keep the doctoral program going from the, the student perspective. Uh, but there are other committees. There's, there's one doctoral student every year who, who serves on the doctoral committee for the school. There are students who get asked to serve on the diversity committee. Sometimes they even get asked to serve on uni university-wide committees, although obviously there are fewer of those committees and there's a lot more doctoral students across campus. But, but there are more commonly would be service within the school. And as you move on and, and, and get further towards the end of the doctoral program, you might get asked to serve on service outside of the university, basically for conferences to be to have some role in helping to organize some conference, organizing a panel or, or maybe being on, in some kind of leadership role in a conference. As a faculty member, you do all those same kinds of things, you just have slightly different roles. So again, conduct studies, but now take the primary responsibility for the grant rather than just filling in some sections that you might do as, as a doctoral student. You'll write papers and maybe books. In teaching, you might not just uh, lead sections, but be responsible for the, whole, for the whole course. You might design new courses, give public lectures, and, and mentor doctoral students as well as, as other as undergraduate students. In service, you'd serve on school committees. You might do program committees and journal reviewing. You might, you might be uh, organizing conferences, and you'd be responsible now to some institution to help that institution do recruiting and make decisions about hiring. Not everybody who graduates from our program is, goes on to be a professor. Uh, not everybody stays in the scholarly community, but the, but, the, but the program is definitely geared towards training you to be a scholar. And, and another place that people, another institutional home for scholars are corporate research labs, government research labs, and, and some kinds of think tanks and nonprofit organizations. So again, you conduct studies, you write white papers and, and write papers for, for journals and uh, have to se secure funding for that research, especially if you're, if you're in these think tanks that are dependent on external funding. You still do teaching even if you're not a professor. And I, I think the training people get is, is important because they end up giving tutorials and explanations. They, if you work at Facebook, uh, you bring in student interns and you have to supervise them and, and mentor them. And you do service. Uh, if you want to stay part of the scholarly community, that's an important thing to do, even if you're not uh, a professor, is to be part of program committees and do journal reviewing. So this is sort of the, the summary saying research, teaching, and service, they happen as a PhD student, and they continue to happen either as a faculty member or a research scientist, just the roles change a little bit as you get more senior and have more experience and people trust you to make the institutions continue and improve or get worse, depending on what you do in, in those service roles.